Anybody ever read the book by John Bevere called The Bait of Satan? Yeah, a lot of hands going up. And, and what, was the, what was the bait that John Bevere was talking about? Do you remember? Offense, yeah. So it's like, don't take the bait of offense of Satan, right? So Joseph could have done that in prison. You think about different people in the Bible. He, he sold into slavery by his brothers. He's helping out uh, at Potiphar's house. He's falsely accused. He gets thrown in jail. They make him the head of the jail. He prophesies over a guy who goes into Pharaoh's court. I mean, if anybody could have had a bitterness in their heart and been offended and shut down over that, it could have been Joseph, but he didn't. He just kept his heart open. So Psalm 160, uh, I'm sorry, 119, we'll start in verse 161 of Psalm 119. It's a great psalm. Uh, again, like during the fast, I highly encourage you to, uh, to get in the word. Right, at, right early on in the first few verses, it says, Thy word I have hidden my heart, that I might not sin against you. Oh, God, it's a rich one. It's a lot of verses. But this is a little section. And 161 says, Princes persecute me without a cause. Right? So people in authority, if you're Desmond Doss, your commander is saying, you'll never be with me in battle. And the governance of Jesus is so strong, and the peace is so big inside of him, he's going, oh no, you'll see. I'm going to be saving lives while you're taking lives. <sighs> Doesn't matter if princes are persecuting you without a cause, persecuting you without a cause, because if you know God told you to do something, then you could stay at peace in the midst of that storm. And then it says, but my heart stands in awe of your word. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. See how important your altar is? The altar of your prayer time, the altar of where you start your day and why you should do it in the morning. And you know, a lot of us got a little thrown off because we were out of our routine in the last five months. We kind of got used to a certain routine and you get a little rattled. I've had people say, something snapped inside my brain and I just started eating every carb I could find. That was this week. Somebody said that to me. I can understand that. I really can because there's some kind of comfort in that. But when you've got that altar built for you, whatever that means for you, but you know, you've got a war for your altar. There's, there's, the enemy's going to come and try to keep you from praying and keep you from getting in the word and keep you focused on all this ADD kind of stuff that's always swirling around and you lose your peace if you let that happen. So I'm going to win that war for my altar. I'm going to start on my knees in the morning and I'm going to say, God, I know I need you today. There's no way I'm getting through this day with your peace unless you're the governor of my soul. And I love verse 162. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. But then 165 is really the key. It says, great peace have those who love your law and nothing causes them to stumble. <laughs> say that with me. Great peace have those who love your law and nothing, one more time, nothing causes them to stumble. Oh. See, and that's part of what John Bevere was saying is the offense is like bait in a trap. And you remember the old days when you were a kid, you used to set up a box and you'd put a stick under the box and hope the animal would go in and, and then you would pull the stick out. Anybody old enough to have done that? No? All right, well, we used to do it, me and Lisa. You were in Indiana, I was in New Jersey, same idea. That baited stick is a fence. Don't take the bait. It's a trap. Great peace have they who love your law. And nothing will cause them to stumble. You increase the governance of Jesus over your life, and you get great peace. Nobody can take it away. Trisha said that I talked too long last week, so I'm trying to go quick. <laughs> Matthew 16, 19. Go, go to Matthew 16, 19, because I think this is one of the keys that Jesus was talking about. I'm, I'm reading it from the Passion Translation. Matthew 16, 19, 19 says, I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm. All right, now that's a really good way to say it. The domain of the king 
is where he has dominion. That's what kingdom means. It's the domain of the king. When can you step into that domain? 24-7, 365. Your choice, though. You've got to step into that domain because there's many other domains that are trying to pull you into their thinking and their governance so that you'll rule your life by their way of thinking. And there's this major war going on to be in that abundance of increase of peace in the king's domain. Hope it's making sense to you. I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm. Because when you think about the kingdom of heaven, some of you might think that just means when I die and I go to heaven. It's the kingdom realm available to us now. And the Passion Translation really does a good job of helping you see that. There's a realm of the kingdom that's a very present help in time of trouble. It's accessible to you, but you've got to be intentional about accessing it. You've got to log into that domain name of the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God.com. That would be a really good one, wouldn't it? I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind.com. I like that domain name. Boy, that's what he said, the greatest and your neighbor as yourself.com. <laughs> that's a little bit harder one, isn't it? <laughs> so how do I do this? John 20, 21. And boy, John 20, whew, that's another one. On the fast, well, you have some extra time and you want to eat the word, eat John 20, boy. And I'll tell you what, on the first day of the week, it just sounds like Genesis 1, on the first day. And this is the first day of the week when Jesus was resurrected. So John 20 is all about what happens on that first day that he's resurrected and he appears to a woman who had had seven demons cast out of her. The first person to see him is Mary. Hallelujah. He's no respecter of persons. Don't you love that? Regardless of your past, he's looking at your present. And you come into my governance, you get my peace. How come the other apostles weren't there? Mary was there. She loved much. Different portion of scripture. It might be a different Mary, but it's the same point. She loved much. She was going to be there to minister to his body. And she thinks he's the gardener, remember? And that would be just like Adam, because he was supposed to be a gardener, but now on the first day of the new week in the new covenant, she thinks he's the gardener. Hopefully you see the irony of that. And then in verse 21, it's a little bit later in that first day of the week, and he goes to the room where the apostles are. And what's the first thing he says to you? Peace be with you, <laughs> all right? That's the blessing of peace. It might have been because they were a little scared to see somebody enter the room without coming through the door. <laughs> but that was uh, translated into joy because they realized it was him. And he really is alive. And then he says, okay, now that you know what I told you is true and I'm alive and resurrected, I'm going to give you some marching orders. As the Father has sent me, it says in verse 21, I am sending you. How many of you have answered that call to feel like you're being sent by the Lord on a mission? Can I wait and get everybody's hand to go up? If you don't, then we want to pray for you, really. We want to pray for you and anybody who's watching that that will be very clear in your mind. Not your carnal thinking, but knowing from the Lord that this is what he wants you to do. Because when that happens, when your domain is in the king's governance, you'll have peace to walk through the fires that will occur on your way to fulfilling that mission. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then similar in Matthew chapter 10, before he gave them that charge in John 20, he said to them in Matthew 10, as you go, preach this message. Heaven's kingdom realm is accessible to you. That's the gospel of the kingdom, all right? As you go and preach, let people know that the realm of the kingdom of God, which seems so far away, no, it's accessible to you. So if you're going to pray for the sick, you've got to do it in the realm of the king. That's where he has authority. You've got to be in his realm in order to see that healing come to pass. And the way you get in that realm is you surrender to his authority over your life. And that's a hard thing for people to do because the original sin in our life was pride. 
So when you hear the word surrender, that sounds like weakness in your natural man. But Jesus is saying, no, in order to find your life in me, you've got to lose your life in the flesh. You've got to be willing to take on the calling that I give you and then be ready to take the marching orders that I give you. And believe me, when it's, when it's true, you flourish in that calling. And I'm speaking that over every one of you here. You are going to flourish in the calling because there's too much work to be done. Too many things that still need to happen for God for us to be walking around with three cylinders misfiring in our engine. We don't want to be putting along. We got eight cylinders. Let's use all eight. When we pray for people, we want to see them get healed. That's the realm of the God's kingdom that's accessible to people. We have to be surrendered to the way he wants us to do it. That means his governance over my life. And if there's no end to that, no matter where we are in the governance today, we can be more in that place tomorrow. 